Crime and Punishment, Part 1, Subsection 2. Raskolnikov was not used to crowds and, as has already been mentioned, fled all company, especially of late. But now something suddenly drew him to people. Something new was happening in him, as it were, and with that a certain thirst for people made itself felt. After a whole month of this concentrated anguish, this gloomy excitement of his, he was so tired of, out that he wished, if only for a moment, to draw a breath in another world whatever it might be, and despite all the filthiness of the situation, it was with pleasure that he now went on sitting in the tavern. The proprietor of the establishment was in another room, but frequently came into the main room, descending a flight of stairs from somewhere, his foppish black boots with their wide red tops appearing first. He was wearing a long-skirted coat and a terribly greasy black satin waistcoat, with no necktie, and his whole face was, a, was as if oiled like an iron padlock. Behind the, behind the counter was a lad of about fourteen, and there was another younger lad, who served when everything was asked for. There were chopped pickles, dry black bread, and fish cut into pieces, all quite evil-smelling. It was so stuffy that it was almost impossible to sit there, and everything was so saturated with wine smell that it seemed one could get drunk in five minutes from the air alone. We sometimes encounter people, even perfect strangers, who begin to interest us at first sight, somehow suddenly all at once, before a word has been spoken. Such was precisely the impression made on Raskolnikov by the guest who sat apart and looked like a retired official. Later, the young man recalled that the first impression, more than once, and even described, ascribed it to a presentiment. He kept glancing at the official, also no doubt because the latter was looking persistently at him, and, no one, and one could see that he very much wanted to start a conversation. But, but at the others in the tavern, not excluding the proprietor. The official looked somehow habitually and even with boredom. And at, as at people of lower precision and development with whom he, show, he saw no point in talking. He was a man already past fifty, of average height and solid build, with some grey in his hair and a large bald spot, with a yellow, even greenish face, swollen from constant drinking, and with puffy eyelids behind which his reddish eyes shone, tiny as slits, but lively. Yet there was something very strange in him. His eyes seemed even to be lit with rapture. Perhaps there, was, there were sense and reason as well. But at the same time, there seemed, to be, there seemed also to be a flicker of madness in them. He was dressed in an old, completely ragged, black frock coat, which had shed all its buttons. Only one still somehow hung on, and this one he kept buttoned, obviously not wishing to shirk convention. Shirk convention. From under his nankeen waistcoat, a shirt frock stuck out, a all crumpled, soiled, and stained. His face had been shaved in official, in official style, but all, but a good while ago, so that thick blue-gray bristles were beginning to show on it, and there was indeed something solidly official in his ways. Yet he was agitated, kept ruffling his hair, and every once in a while leaned his head on his hands in anguish, resting his torn elbows on the split upon and sticky table. Finally, he looked straight at Raskolnikov and said loudly and firmly, May I venture, my dear sir, to engage you in a conversation of decency? For though you are not of important aspect, my experience nevertheless distinguishes in you an educated man, and one unaccustomed to drink. I myself have always respected education, coupled with the feeling of the heart, and moreover I am a titular counselor, Marmaladov. Such is my name titular counsellor, may I venture to ask whether you have been in government service? No, study him. No, study him. The old man, the young man, replied, surprised partly at the peculiar, peculiarly ornate turn of speech and partly at being addressed so directly, point blank. In spite of his recent momentary wish for at least some communion with people, at the first word actually addressed to him, he suddenly felt his usual unpleasant and irritable feeling of loathing towards any stranger who touched or merely wanted to touch his person. A uh, student, then, of a former or a former student, the official cried. Just as I thought, experience, my dear sir, oft repeated experience. And he put his fingers to his forehead in a sign of self-praise. You are a student, or were engaged in some scholarly pursuit. Allow me. He rose slightly, swayed, picked up his little crock and glass, and sat himself with the young man, somewhat catered corner to him. He was drunk, but spoke loquaciously and glibly, only now and then getting a bit confused in places and dragging out his speech. 
He even fell upon Raskolnikov with a sort of greediness, as though he, too, had not talked to anyone for a whole month. My dear sir, he began almost solemnly, poverty is no vice, that is the truth. I know that drunkenness is also no virtue, and that is even more so. But destination, destitution, my dear sir, destitution is a vice, sir. In, destitute, in poverty you may still preserve the nobility of your inborn feelings, but in destitution no one ever does. For destitution one does not even get driven out of human company with a stick. One is swept out with a broom, to make it more insulting, and justifyingly so, and justly so. For in destitution I am the first to insult myself. Hence the drinking. My dear sir, a month ago, Mr. Lebzinyot, Mr. Lebzinyatnikov gave my wife a beating, and my wife is a far cry for me. Do you understand, sir? Allow me to ask you something, if only for the sake of curiosity. Did you ever happen to spend your nights on the Neva, on the hay barges? No, never, Raskolnikov replied. Why do you ask? Well, sir, but that's where I've come from, and it's already the fifth night, sir. He poured himself a glass, drank it, and lapsed into thought. Indeed, one could see bits of hay stuck here and there on his clothes, and even in his hair. It was quite possible that he had not undressed and washed for five days. His hands were especially dirty, greasy, red, with black under his nails. Under the nails. His conversation seemed to arouse general, if lax, attention. The lads at the counter began to snigger. It seemed to it seemed the proprietor came down from the upstairs room on purpose to listen to the funny man and sat some distance away, occasionally yawning lazily but grandly. It was obvious that it would it was obvious that Marmaladov had long been a familiar there. And this penchant for ordinate speech he had probably acquired as a result of his habit of frequent tavern conversation with various strangers. This habit turns into a necessity for certain drunkards, mostly those who are treated harshly and ordered about at home. Hence, in a company of drinkers, they always seem eager to solicit justifications for themselves, and if possible, even respect as well. Funny man, the proprietor said loudly, and why don't you worry? Why don't you serve, since you're an official? Why do I not serve, my dear sir? Marmaladov picked up addressing Raskolnikov exclusively, as if it were he who had asked the question. Why I, why do I not serve? And does my heart not ache over this vain groveling? When Mr. Lebzinyatkov gave my wife a beating a month ago, with his own hands, while I was laying there in my cups, did I not suffer? Excuse me, young man, has it ever happened to you? Hmm? Let's say, to ask hopelessly for a loan of money. It's happened, that is. What do you mean by hopelessly? That is completely hopelessly, sir, knowing beforehand that nothing will come of it. Say, for example, you know beforehand and thoroughly well that this man, this most well-intentioned and most useful citizen, will under no circumstances give you any money. For why should he, may I ask? He knows I won't repay it. Out of compassion? Mr. Lepsian not. Mr. Leps. Mr. Lebziadnikov, who follows all the new ideas, explained the other day that in our time compassion is even forbidden by science, as is already happening in, in, in England, where they have political economy. Why then should he give, may I ask? And so, knowing beforehand that he will not give any, you still set on your way and... But why go? Raskolnikov put in. And what if, what, and what if there is no one else? What if there is no, nowhere else to go? It is necessary that every man has at least somewhere to go, for there are times when one absolutely must go at least somewhere. When my only begotten daughter went out for the first time with the yellow pass, and I went too, then, for my daughter lives on yellow pass, sir, he, he added parenthetically, glancing somewhat worriedly at the young man. Never mind, dear sir, never mind. He hastened to, the, to, the, to declare at once and with apparent calm, when both lads at the counter snorted at the and the proprietor, proprietor himself proprietor himself smiled. Never mind, sir. I'm not troubled by this wagging of heads, for everything is already known to everyone, and everything hidden will be made manifest. I regard it not with disdain, but with humi humility. Let it be, let it be. Behold the man. Excuse me, young man. 
but can you or no to expound a bit more forcefully and more expressively not can you but would you venture looking upon me at this hour to say of me affirmatively that I, that I am not a swine the young man did not answer a word well sir the orate the orator went on having waited sedately and this time with greater dignity for the renewed sniggering in the room to die down well sir so i am a swine and she is a la she is a lady i have the image of a beast and katerina ivanovna my spouse is an educated person and by birth an officious daughter an officer's daughter granted granted i am a scoundrel while she has a lofty heart and is full of sentiments ennobled by good breeding and yet oh if only she felt pity for me my dear sir my dear sir but it is necessary that every man have at least one such place where he too is pitied and katerina ivanovna though she is a magnanimous lady is unjust and though, my, and though I myself understand that when she pulls me by these true tufts of mine, she does it for no other reason than her heart's pity. For, I repeat it without embarrassment, she does pull these tufts of mine, young man. He confirmed with increased dignity, having heard more sniggering. But, God, if she would only just once. But no, no, it, it is all in vain, and there is no use talking, no use talking. For my wish has already been granted more than once, and already more than once I have been pitied. But such is my trait, and I am a, and I am a born brute. That you are, the proprietor remarked, yawning. Marmaladeoff banged his fist resolutely on the table. Such is my trait. Do you know? Do you know, sir, that I even drank her up her stockings, not her shoes, sir, for that would at least somehow resemble the order of things. But her stockings, I drank up her stockings, sir. Her angora kerchief. I also drank up a gift, a former one, hers, not mine, and ours, and our corner is cold, and this winter she caught a chill and took to coughing, with blood now, and we have three small children, and Katerina Ivanovna works day and night, scrubbing and cleaning and washing the children, for she has been used to cleanliness since childhood, and she has a weak chest, and is inclined to consumption, and I feel it, do I not feel it, and the more I drink, the more I feel it, it is just for this drink that I drink, that I that in drinking I may seek compassion and feeling. It is not joy I seek, but sorrow only. I drink, for I wish doubly, doubly to suffer. And he bent his head to the table as if in despair. Young man, he continued, unbending again. In your face I read, as it were, a certain sorrow. I read it when you entered, and therefore I addressed you at once. For by telling you the story of my life, I do not wish to expose myself to disgrace before these lovers of idleness, who know everything anyway, but I'm seeking a sensitive and educated man. No, then, that my spouse was educated in an, aristoc in an aristocratic provincial institute for the nobility, and at her graduation danced with a shawl before the governor and other notables, for which she received a gold medal and a certificate of merit. The medal, well, we sold the medal long ago. Hmm. The, the certificate of merit is still lying in her trunk. She showed it to our landlady just recently, and though she is the most ceaseless strife with our landlady, she is in the most ceaseless strife with our landlady. She Still, she wished to feel proud before someone, at least, and to tell of the happy days gone by. And I do not judge, I do not judge, for this is the last thing to her in her memories, the last thing left to her in her memories, and the rest has gone to ruin. Yes, yes, she is a hot, proud, and unbending lady. She washes the floors herself and eats black bread, but this respect for herself she will not tolerate. That is why she would not let Mr. Lebzinyatnikov, Mr. Lebz, Lebzinyatnikov, get away with his rudeness, and when Mr. Lebzinyatnikov gave her a beating for it, she took to her bed, not so much from the beating as for, from emotion. She came to me, already a widow, with three children, each one smaller than the next. She married for her first hunt. She married her first husband, an, inf an infantry officer, out of love, and eloped with him from her parental home. She loved her husband exceedingly, but he got into card play, was taken to court, and thereupon died. He used to beat her towards the end, and though she would not let him get away with it, as I am informed of a certainty, with and with documents, yet to this day she remembers him with tears and holds him up to me in reproach, and I am glad, I am glad for at last, in her, at least in her imaginings, she beholds herself as having once been happy. 
and after him she was left with three young children in a remote and savage district where i was living at the time and she left in such hopeless destitution as i though my adventures have been many and varied and am scarce, scarcely able to describe and her relations had all renounced her besides she was proud much too proud and it was then my dear sir it was then that i be i being a widower myself and having a fourteen-year-old daughter from my first wife offered her my hand for i could not look on at such suffering you may judge thereby what degrees her calamities had reached if she well educated and well bred and of known family consented to marry me but she did weeping and sobbing and wringing her hands she did for she had nowhere to go do you understand do you understand my dear sir what it means when there is no longer anywhere to go no that you do not understand and for a whole year i fulfilled my duties piously and sacredly and did not touch this he jabbed his fingers at the bottle for i do not have feelings but even so i could not please her and then i lost my position also through no fault of my own but because of change of staff and then i did touch it it is now a year and a half since we finally ended up after much wandering and numerous calamities and this splendid capital adorned with numerous monuments and here i found a position found it and lost it again do you understand this time i lost it through my own fault for this trait of mine appeared again we now live in a corner at amelia F fyodorovna liposchros and what we live on and pay with i do not know there are many other living there besides ourselves a sodom sir a most outrageous one hmm, yes and meanwhile my daughter from my first marriage also grew up and what she had to suffer for her stepmother while she was growing up that i shall pass over in silence for though katerina ivanovna is filled with magnanimous feelings she is a hot and irritable lady and an and an abrupt one yes sir well no use going over that sonya as you can imagine received no education i tried four years ago to teach her ge geography and world history but since i myself was not firm in this knowledge and there was and there were besides no suitable textbooks for whatever books had left we had left hmm. well there were no, there are no books any more so that there was the end of all education we stopped at Cy cyrus of persia later having reached maturity she read several books of a no of a novelistic purport purport p u r p o r t and recently thanks to mr lebziatnikov one more book lewis's Physio physiology perhaps you know it sir read it with great interest and even recited some extracts aloud for us that is the whole of her enlightenment and now my dear sir i will address you with a private question of my own how much in your opinion can a poor but honest girl earn by honest labor not even fifteen kopecks a day sir if she's honest and has no special talents and even then and, e and even then only if her hands are never still for a moment and even then even then the counsellor klopstock ivan ivanovich perhaps you've heard of him has not only still not paid for the half dozen holland shirts she made him but even offended her and ch chased her away stamping his feet and calling her bad names on the pretext that the collars were the wrong size and too pointed and the children and here the children were hungry and here katerina ivanovna was pacing the room wringing her hands and flushed spots came out on her cheeks as always happens when with the ill with this illness you live with us she says you good for nothing you eat and drink and use up warmth and that is and that what is there and what is there to eat and drink if even the children don't see a crust of bread for three days on end i was lying there well what of it lying there in my cups sir I heard Sonya say, she's uncomplaining and, ha and has such a meek little voice. She's fair, her face is always so pale, thin. And so she said, what if Katerina Ivanovna, what, Katerina Ivanovna, must I really go and do such things? And Daria Fransevna, an ill-meaning woman, and one oft known to the people, to the police, had already made inquiries three times through the landlady. And what? Katerina Ivanovna answered mockingly. What's there to save? Some treasure. But don't, but do not blame her. Do not blame her, my dear sir. Do not blame her. She said this, not in her right mind, but in an emotional agitation, in sickness, 
and with the children crying from hunger, and said it, besides, more for the sake of the insult than in any strict sense, for such is Katerina Ivanovna's character. And when the children get to crying, and if, even if it's from hunger, she, from hunger, she starts beating them at once. So then, some time after five, I see Sonetchka get up, put on her kerchief, put on her wrap, and go out, and she came back home after eight. She came in, went straight to Katerina Ivanovna, and silently laid thirty rubles on the table in front of her. Not a word with it, not even a glance. She just took our big green flannel shawl. We have this one flannel shawl for all of us. Covered her head and face with it completely, and lay down on the bed, face to the wall. Only her little shoulders and her whole body kept trembling, and I was lying there in the same aspect as previously, sir, and then I saw a young man. At the, after that I saw Katerina Ivanovna go over to Sonetchka's bed, also without saying a word, and for the whole evening she stayed kneeling at her feet, kissing her feet, and would not get up, and then they both fell asleep together, embracing each other. Both. Both. Yes, sir. And I was lying there in my cups, sir. Marmaladov fell silent, as though his voice had failed him. Then suddenly he poured a quick glass, drank it, and grunted. Since then, my dear sir, he went on after some silence. Since then, owing to an unfortunate occurrence and reports made by ill-meaning persons, which Darya Fratznevna especially abetted on the pretext that she had not been shown due respect, since then my daughter, Sofya Seminovna, has, has been obliged to carry a yellow, a yellow pass, and under such circumstances could no longer remain with us. For the landlady, Amelia Fyodorovna, would not allow it, though she, though she herself had abetted Darya Fretznevna before, and Mr. Lebziatnikov also. Hmm. It was because of Sonya that this story happened between him and Katerina Ivanovna. First he, called so he sought after Sonya himself, but then he suddenly got off. What? he said. Is such an enlightenment man as myself to live in the same apartment? With, a, with such a woman, and Katerina Ivanovna would not let that pass. She interfered. Well, so it happened, and now Sonetchka comes to us mostly at dusk, and helps Katerina Ivanovna, and brings whatever means she can, but she lives at the tailor Kapanomov's. She rents a room for him, from him, and Kapanor... Kapanomov is lame and tongue-tied, and the whole of his extremely numerous family is also tongue-tied. And his wife, too, is tongue-tied. They occupy one room, and Sonya has her own, separately, with a partition. Hmm, yes. The poorest people, and all of them tongue-tied, yes. So I got up the next morning, sir, put on my rags on, put my rags on, lifted up my hands to heaven, and went to see His Excellency, Ivan Af Afnasyevich. Do you know His Excellency Ivan Afnasyevich? No? Then you have missed knowing a man of God. He is wax, wax before the face of, of the Lord. As the wax melteth, he even shed a tear when he heard it all. Well, Marmaladov, he said, you have deceived my expectations once already. I am taking you one more time, on my personal responsibility. And that's just what he said. Remember that, he said. Now go. I kissed the dust at his feet, mentally, because in reality he would not have allowed it, being a dignitary and a man of new politi political and educated thinking. I went home again. And when I announced that I had been taking, taken back into the service and would have a salary, oh Lord, what went on then? Marmaladov again stopped in great agitation. At the moment, at, at that moment, a whole party of drinkers walked in the street, already drunk to begin with, and from the entrance came the sound of a hired barrel organ and a child's cracked seven-year-old voice singing the little farm. It became noisy. The proprietor and servants occupied themselves with the newcomers. Marmaladov, ignoring the newcomers, went on with his story. He seemed to have grown quite weak, but the drunker he got, the more loquacious he became. The recollection of his recent success in the service seemed to animate him, and even reflected in his face a, as a sort of radiance. As a sort of radiance. Raskolnikov listened attentively. That was a whole five years, five weeks ago, sir. Yes, as soon as the two of them, Katerina Ivanovna and Sonetchka, found out, Lord, it was just as though I'd moved into the, into the kingdom of God. I used to lie there like a brute. All I heard was abuse. But now they were tiptoeing around, quieting the children. Semyon Sak Sakarich is tired from his work. He's resting. Shh. They brought me coffee before work, which scalded cream. With scalded cream, they started 
and they started getting real creep. Do you hear how they managed to knock together 11 rubles and 50 kopecks to have me decently outfitted? I don't understand. Boots, cotton shirt fronts, magnif most magnificent, a uniform. They cooked it all up for 11.50 in the most excellent aspect, sir. The day, the first day I came home after a morning's work, I saw that Katerina Ivanovna had prepared two courses, soup and corned beef with horseradish, with which we'd had no notion of before then. She doesn't have any dresses. I mean, not any, sir, and here it was, as if she were going to a party, all dressed up, and not just in anything, no. She knows how to do it all, out of, not of nothing. She fixed her hair, put on some clean collar, some cuffs, and quite a different person emerged. Younger and prettier. Sonetka, my dove, contributed only money. And as for herself, she said, for the time being, it's not proper for me to visit you too often, or only when it's dark so no one can see me. Do you hear? Do you hear? I went to take a nap after dinner. And what do you suppose? Katerina Ivanovna simply couldn't help herself. Just a week earlier, she had quarreled to the, to the ultimate degree with the landlady, Emilia Fyodorovna, and now she invited her for a cup of coffee. They sat whispering for two hours. So, she said, Semyon Sakarich has worked now and is getting a salary, and he went to His Excellency himself, and His Excellency came out in person and told everyone to wait, and took Semyon Sakarich by the arm, and that led him past everyone into the office. Do you hear? Do you hear? Of course I remember your merits, Semyon Sakharich. And though you were given to that frivolous weakness, you are now, since you, since you have now promised, and moreover, since without you things have gone badly for us. Hear that, hear that. I shall not place my hopes, he said, in your gentleman's word. That is, I must tell you, she up and invented it all, and really out of frivolous, and not really out of frivolousness, not merely to boast, sir. No, she believed it all. She delights in her own fancies. By God, sir. And I do not condemn that. No, I do not condemn it. And six days ago, when I brought home my first salary, 23 rubles and 40 kopecks, brought it all in full, she called me a sweet little thing. You sweet little thing, she said. We were by ourselves, sir, you understand. And what sort of beauty would you say is in me? And what sort of husband am I? But no, she pinched my cheek and said, you little sweet thing. Marmalidov stopped, wanted to, wanted to smile, but suddenly his chin began to tremble. He restrained himself, however. The pothouse, the depraved look of the man, the five nights on the hay barges, the half to bottle, and at the same time this morbid love for his wife and family, bewildered his listener. Raskolnikov listened tensely, but with a morbid sensation. He was annoyed that he had stopped at that place. My dear sir, my dear sir, Marmalidov exclaimed, recovering himself. Oh, sir, perhaps it's all just a laughing matter for you, as it is for everyone else. And I'm merely bothering you with the foolishness of all these measly details of my domestic life. But for me, it's no laughing matter, for I can feel feel it all. And in the course of that whole per paradise old day of my life, and at, of that whole evening I spent in fleeting dreams, that is, how would I arrange it all, and would dress the children, and would give her peace, and would bring back my only begotten daughter from dishonor into the bosom of the family, and so much, so much. It's permissible, sir. And then, my dear sir, Marmaladov suddenly gave a sort of start, raised his head, and looked straight at his listener. And then, sir, the very next day, after all those dreams, that is, exactly five days ago, towards evening, by means of cunning deceit, like a thief in the night, I stole the key to Katerina Ivanovna's trunk from her, took out all that remained of the salary I had brought home. I don't remember how much. And now, sir, look at me, all of you, five days, ago, five days away from home. They're looking for me, and it's at the end of my service, and my uniform is lying in a tavern near Egypt, the Egyptian bridge, and these garments I received in, in exchange for it, and it is the end of my everything. Marmaladov struck himself on the forehead with his fist, clenched his teeth, closed his eyes, and leaned heavily on the table with his elbow. But a moment later his face suddenly changed, and glancing at, glancing at Raskolnikov with a, with a certain affected coyness and forced insolence, he laughed and said, and today I went to see Sonia and asked for her the hair of the dog. <laughs> <coughs> Did she give it to you? One of the newcomers shouted from the side, shouted and guffered, guffered at the top of his lungs. This very bottle here was bought on her money, sir, Marmaladov said, addressing Raskolnikov exclusively. She took out 30 kopecks for me with her own hands, the last she had. I saw it myself. She didn't say anything. She just looked at me inside and me. That is not done on earth, but up there. People are grieved for, wept for, and not repro repro and not reproached. Not reproached. And it hurts more. It hurts more, sir, when one is not reproached. Thirty kopecks, yes, sir. And does 
doesn't she also need them now, eh? What do you think, my dear gentleman? For she has to observe her cleanliness now. This cleanliness of a special sort, you understand, costs money. Understand? And to buy a bit of pomade as well. Can't do without that, sir. Starch petticoats, some shoes of a frippery sort, to show off her foot when she steps over a puddle. Do you understand? Do you understand, sir, what this cleanliness means? So, sir, and now I... Her blood father snatched these thirty kopecks for the hair of the dog, and I'm drinking, sir, and I've already drunk them up, sir. So who's going to pity the likes of me, eh? Do you pity me now, sir, or do you not? Speak, sir. Do you or do you not? <laughs> he wanted to pour some more. There was nothing left. The bottle was empty. Why pity you? shouted the proprietor, who turned up, ne who turned up near them again. There was laughter and even swearing. The laughter and swearing came both from those who were listening and from those who were not listening, but merely looking at the figure of the retired official. Pity! Why pity me? Marble laid off suddenly cried out, raising, rising with his hand stretched forth in decided inspiration, as if he had only been waiting for these words. Why pity me, you say? Yes, there's nothing to me to pity me for. I ought to be crucified, crucified on the cross, and not pitied, but crucified, oh, judge, crucified, and having crucified the man. And then I myself will come to you to be crucified, for I thirst not for joy, but for sorrow and tears. Do you think, wine merchants, that this bottle of yours brought me sweetness? Sorrow, sorrow I sought at its bottom, sorrow and tears, and I tasted it and found it. And he will pity me, us who pitied everyone, and who understand all men and all women. He alone, and he is the judge. On that day he will come and ask, where's the daughter who gave herself for a wicked and consumptive stepmother, for a stranger's little children where's the daughter who pitied her earthly father a, fo a foul drunkard not shrinking from his beastliness and he will say come i have already forgiven you once i have i have forgiven you once and now too your many sins are forgiven and you have loved much and he will forgive my sonya he will forgive her i know he will today when i was with her i felt it in my heart and he will judge and forgive all and the good and the wicked and the wise and the dumb and he will he has finished with everyone and then he will say unto us too you too come forth he will say come forth my drunk ones my weak ones my shameless ones and we will all come forth without being ashamed and stand there and he will say swine you are of the image of the beast of the of his seal but come you too and the wise and the reasonable will say unto him lord why do you receive such as these and he will say i receive them my wise and reasonable ones for as much as not one of them considered himself worthy of this and he will stretch out his arms to us we and we will fall at his feet, feet and weep and understand everything then we will understand everything and everyone will understand everything and katerina ivanovna she too will understand everything lord the kingdom they come and he sank onto the bench, exhausted and weak, not looking at anyone, apparently ob ob oblivious of his surrounding and in deep thought. His words produced a certain impression. For a moment, silence reigned. But soon, laughter and swearing were heard again. Nice reasoning. Blather. Real official. And so on and so forth. Let us go, sir. Marmaladov said suddenly, raising his head and turning to Raskolnikov. Take me, Kozal's house, through the courtyard. It's time. To Katerina Ivanovna. Raskolnikov had been waiting to, had been wanting to leave, and, he, and had himself thought on of helping him. Marmaladov, who turned out to be much weaker on his feet than on than in his speeches, leaned heavily on the young man. They had to go two or three hundred steps. Confusion and fear took more and more possession of the drunkard as he neared home. It's not Katerina Ivanovna I'm afraid of now, he muttered in agitation. And now that she'll start pulling my hair. Forget the hair. The hair's nonsense. I can tell you. It's even better if she start, starts pulling it. That's not what I'm afraid of. I. It's her eyes I'm afraid of. Yes, her eyes. I'm also afraid of the flush spots on her cheeks and also her breathing. Have you seen how people with that illness breathe? With their feelings aroused? When their feelings are aroused? And I'm afraid of the children's crying too. Because if Sonia hasn't been feeding them, then I don't know what. I really don't know. And I'm afraid of, of a beating. I'm not afraid of a beating. No, sir, that such beatings are not only painful, but are even a delight to me, for I myself cannot do without them. It's better. Let her beat me. To ease her soul, it's better. Here's the house, Kozo's house. A locksmith, a German, a rich one. Take me in. They entered through the courtyard and went up to the fourth floor. The higher up, the darker the, higher up, the, darker the stairway became. It was nearly eleven o'clock by then, and though at that time of the year there's no real light, there's no real night in St. Petersburg, it was very dark at the top of the stairs. At the head of the stairs, at the very top, a small, suit blackened door stood open. A candle then lighted the poorest of rooms, 
about 10 paces long, the whole of it could be seen from far from the entryway. Everything was scattered about in this scattered about and in disorder. All sorts of children's rags, especially. A torn sheet hung between across the back corner. Behind it was probably a bed. The only content of the room itself were two chairs and a and an oilcloth sofa, very ragged, before which stood an old pine kitchen table, unpainted and uncovered. At the end of the table stood an iron candlestick with the butt of a tallow candle burning down it. It appeared that this room of marmalade offs was a separate one, not just a corner, though other tenants had to pass through it. The door to the further rooms, or hutches, into which Amelia Lippewishel's apartment had been divided, was ajar. Behind it there was noise and shouting, guffawing. Car playing and tea drinking seemed to be going on. Occasionally, the most unceremonious words would fly out. Raskolnikov immediately recognized Katerina Ivanovna. She was a terribly wasted woman, slender, quite tall and trim, still with beautiful dark brown hair, and indeed with flushed spots on her cheeks. She was pacing the room, her hands pressed to her chest, her lips parched, her breath uneven and gasping. Her eyes glittered as with fever, but her gaze was sharp and fixed, and with the last light of the burnt-down candle, and, flickering on it, this consumptive and agitated face produced a painful impression. To Raskolnikov, she appeared about thirty years old, and Marmaladov was indeed no match for her. She did not hear <coughs> or notice them as they entered. She seemed to be in some sort of, of oblivion, not hearing or seeing anything. The room was stuffy, yet she had not opened the window. A stench came from the stairs, yet, to the, yet the door to the stairs was not shut. Waves of, waves of tobacco smoke came through the open door from the inner rooms. She was coughing, yet she did not close the door. The smallest child, a girl of, of about six, was asleep on the floor, sitting somehow crouched with her head buried in the sofa. The boy, a year older, stood in the corner crying and trembling all over. He had probably just been beaten. The older girl, about nine, tall and thin as a match, match stick, wearing only a poor shirt, all in tatters, with a th threadbare flannel wrapped around over her bare shoulders, probably made for her two years before, since it now did not even reach her knees, stood in the corner of her in the corner by her little brother, her long arm dry as a matchstick around his neck. She was whispering something to him, apparently trying to calm him, doing all she could to restrain him so that he would not somehow stop whimpering again. And at the same time following her mother fearfully with her big dark eyes, which seemed even bigger in her wasted and frightened little face. Marmaladov knelt just at the door, without entering the room, and pushed Raskolnikov forward. The woman, seeing the stranger, stopped distractedly in front of him, having come to her senses for a moment, and appeared to be asking herself why he was there. But she must have fancied at once that he was going to some other room and only passing through theirs. Having come to this conclusion, and taking no further notice of him, she went to the entryway to close the door, and suddenly gave a cry, seeing her husband kneeling there in the doorway. Ah! she cried in a frenzy. He's come back. The jailbird. The monster. Where's the money? What's in your pocket? Show me. And those aren't the same clothes. Where are your clothes? Where is the money? Speak! And she fell to searching him. Marmaladov at once spread his arms humbly and obediently to make the search of his pockets easier. Not only not a kopeck was left of the money. But where is the money? She shouted. Oh lord, did you really drink up all of it? There were twelve, twelve rubles left in the trunk. And suddenly, in a rage, she seized him by the hair and dragged him into the room. Marmaladov made her efforts easier by meekly crawling after her on his knees. And it's a delight to me. It's not painful. It's a delight, my dear sir. He kept crying out, pulling, crying. He kept crying out, being pulled by his hair all the while, and once even bumping his forehead on the floor. The child who was asleep on the floor woke up and started to cry. The child who was asleep on the floor woke up and started to cry. The boy in the corner could not help himself. Trembled, cried out, and rushed to his sister in a terrible fright, almost a fit. The older girl, half awake, was trembling like a leaf. Drank it up, drank it, drank it up, drank up all of it, all of it, the poor woman kept shouting in despair. And they are not the same clothes. Hungry, hungry, she pointed at the children, wringing her hands. Oh, curse this life, and you, aren't you ashamed? She suddenly fell upon Raskolnka. Coming from the pot house, were you drinking with him? Were you drinking with him, too? Get out! The young woman hastened to leave without saying a word. Besides, the inner door had been thrown wide open, and several curious faces were peering into it. Insolent, laughing heads were with cigarettes or pipes and skull caps craning their necks. One glimpsed figures in dressing gowns that hung quite open, or in indecently summerish costumes, some with cards in their hands. They laughed with particular glee with, when Marmaladov, dragged about by his hair, shouted that it was a delight to him. They even started to, 
They even started edging into the room. Finally, an ominous shrieking was heard. This was Amelia Lippewechel herself, tearing her way through to restore order in her own fashion and frighten the poor woman and frighten the poor woman for the hundredth time with an abusive command to clear out of the apartment by the next day. As he was leaving, Raskolnikov managed to thrust his hand in his, into his pocket, break up whatever coppers he had to, he happened to find from the ruble he had changed in the tavern, and put them uh, and put them unobserved on the window window sill. Window sill. Afterwards, on the stairs, he thought better of it and wanted to go back. What a stupid thing to have done! He thought. They had their Sonia, and I needed myself. But realizing that it was now impossible to take it back, and that he would not take it back in any case, he waved his hand and went home to his own apartment. Sonia needs a bit of pomade as pomade as well, he went on, and grinned caustically as he strolled along the street. This cleanliness costs money. Mm -mm. And maybe Sonechka will also go bankrupt today, because there's the same risk in it. Trapping, prospecting for gold. And so tomorrow, without my money, they'd all be on dry beans. Bravo, Sonia. What a well... What a well they've dug for themselves, however, however, and they use it. They really do use it, and they got accustomed to it. Wept a bit and got accustomed. Man gets accustomed to everything. The scoundrel! He fell to thinking. But if that's a lie, he suddenly exclaimed involuntarily. If a man, in fact, is not a scoundrel, in general, that is, the whole human race, then the rest is all mere prejudice, instilled by fear. And there are no barriers. And that's just how it should be.